Welcome. This is the training for um, transition from early intervention services to school age for students with disabilities. And we have Katie from, I'm going to butcher this, so Raphael and Associates, right? You got it right. Look at okay. that. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Uh, disclaimer, the ARC of Lehigh and Northampton County um, Advocacy Department does not employ lawyers or provide legal advice. This training and others provided by the ARC Advocacy Department does not constitute or imply the endorsement recommendations or favoring of the providing parties or any employees or contractors acting on this behalf. This webinar is being provided for education and informational purpose only. And now it is my pleasure to do, introduce our guest, Katie. Katie has been practicing special education and service law since 2010. Although Katie um, represented public school districts in the past, she has always had an eye on the best interests for students. Katie has a, a uh, expertise in all the areas of special education, analyzing and providing advice regarding special education documents, attending IEPs, due process hearings, and advocating for clients in federal court. Katie graduated uh, from Temple University in 2002. Katie is an avid Philadelphia sports fan and music lover as well. Thank you all and the Zoom is yours. Thank you, Cody. Hi, everyone. Um, um, it's going to be weird not seeing people, so feel free, um, as everybody said, to put um, talk to me in the chat. Um, it's going to be weird to hear myself for over an hour without talking to people. Um, so I currently represent parents, and as Cody was saying in my introduction, I, I used to represent school districts, so I have a really good sense of you know, school districts um, and and public LEAs, charter schools, and and what um, their responsibilities are, but oftentimes what they're thinking, which some um, parent attorneys don't, you know, have not never been in that situation. So, um, I, I since I've um, started representing parents in 2019, I, I think that it's brought a good sense of, you know, understanding to people to really understand where school districts are coming from. And when I did represent school districts, I actually had a due process hearing for a child who was transitioning out of early intervention and into kindergarten. So I'm going to weave that experience in as we um, go through um, and, and talk. Um, and again, feel free. I'm going to kind of go through some legal stuff and feel free to ask me questions. Um, but it, it's it's a, you know, special education is complicated no matter what, whether you're in birth to three or in three to five or in, you know, in, in school age, it's extremely complicated and um, complex statute and regulations. And there's, you know, the federal obligations, there's Pennsylvania and state obligations. It's very difficult to navigate, um, you know, even for the most experienced parents. Um, I, I, um, have had clients who are lawyers. It's very difficult to understand. So I'm hoping that I can just kind of talk about what um, you're, if you're going through the experience, what you're, what is going to happen over the next couple months, or if you're not quite there yet, and maybe your child's four, you know, maybe, you know, you're wondering what's going to happen next year. So um, I'm hoping that I can bring, you know, just a kind of sense of, of what to expect after the presentation. So I just have some, you know, what the legal requirements are for the preschool um, program and the early intervention program is that they're the ones um, who are charged with identifying um, who the, the children are um, that are approaching five years old um, or for the, for the children who are um, spending an extra year in kindergarten, those are turning six, they're the ones, the preschool, not this, the public school or the charter school are the ones charged with identifying and giving the list of students to um, the school. So just to kind of, just so you know, that's what's happening um, and what has happened, I guess, by yesterday um, on February 1st, that a list of, of children have been given to the school district of residence. And if you guys hopefully have seen, um, 
there should have been um, discussions in your IEP meetings um, about transition into uh, kindergarten. So there's a section at the end, near the end of your early intervention IEP um, that talks about transition. So that should have been or will be go gone over with you. Um, but just to kind of, I just kind of wanted to give some background as to what is happening leading into the transition meeting, um, which I have here as the first step. Yeah. Um, so the first question is, doesn't the transition out of early intervention birth to three happen at three when the IEP begins? Yes. Um, so if your child is identified in birth to three, there is a separate transition that happens um, for birth to three to three to five. Um, and I actually, my daughter was in birth to three, so I personally experienced what that was like. And it was a very um, emotional process, I think I want to say, um, you know, and it, it's like, you know, and I'm a lawyer and I do this for a living and this is all I do is special education. And I, it was still very overwhelming, all of the paperwork um, that was given to me as a parent. Um, but if, yes, if your child qualifies for birth to three, there is a whole process that um, happens. Um, but there are lots of children who get identified for the first time in, um, in three to five services. And we're specifically talking about today what that process is when you are in um, the three to five services, what happens because it is very different from when you go from birth to three to three to five, from three to five to school age. And, and just the terminology, which we're gonna talk about near the end is different. Um, programming is different. So yes, if you if your child is identified in birth of three, there is a transition process, but today we're specifically talking about um, when a child is transitioning from um, three to five to kindergarten. Um, and so the first step is a transition meeting. Like I see um, that Pamela, you guys have your transition meeting coming up. That is an extremely important meeting and is really is the first step um, in the transition to um, in the transition to kindergarten, and I um, I always tell our parents to go because some you know are not sure of whether they're going to transition or take the extra year in early intervention, um, and I always tell parents to go, keep an open mind, you know, hear what everybody has to say um, because that is really the meeting that triggers. At all of the responsibilities for the school district um, or the charter school. Um, that all of the meetings must convene. And this is, the, I, I don't have the, the statutes on here or the regulations, but all of this is coming from, from Pennsylvania um, and what the timelines are. So if you haven't been already, you should be being contacted very soon since it's early February for the meetings, the transition meetings to happen. Um, some um, early intervention programs are better than others. Um, and also the early intervention programs um, interface with a lot of um, interface with a lot of different school districts. So that's the other thing that they have, you know, they're not just responsible for where you live, but everybody in, you know, typically it's the intermediate unit that's that's running the early intervention. Um, Okay, um, we'll, we'll get to that in a second about that you, that you never had a transition meeting, but that's definitely a problem. Um, because at the transition meeting, what happens is it's, a, it's the preschool programs meeting to run because they're the ones charged with, again, giving the names over to the school district um, and then the school district becoming aware really for the first time of the children in their districts that are already found eligible for special education that are already found eligible for having educational disabilities. So it's the preschool program who's running that transition meeting and they um, are having a school district or a charter school representative there. Um, and oftentimes you're talking about, and there's a lot that's happening, but um, you're talking about what's gonna happen next. You're gonna be given a form, which I have on here, um, is the intent to register form. That form, and again, like this doesn't commit you to enrollment. And I think I have it on here too, yes. 
that this form, when you fill it out and you complete it, does not mean that you're absolutely registered, that you're enrolled, that you're definitely sending your child to kindergarten in the fall. But what it does is it puts the school district or the charter school um, on notice that now their responsibilities start for your child. So I always tell everyone, if you're undecided or in doubt, sign that form. And especially in February, because you wanna make sure that th the things are happening and, and you know, because August and September come very fast. Um, and, you know, before you know it, it'll be, I know we don't realize it now since we just had snow and it's cold, but it, the summer will be here before we know it. So I always tell people, you know, you want to start early um, and you want to start soon because as we're going to get to, if there has to be a, an evaluation and if the school district proposes to do an evaluation, you know, that there's all kinds of timelines on that. Um, and so does anyone have any questions or has been through this that has any questions about the intent to register form? The one thing I do want to say is that once you do fill that out, um, and typically what happens is there's also a, a um, um, a consent that, that the school districts asked to sign to get the records, that's actually not legally required. The intent to register form is what triggers their duties and they can actually get your child's records from the preschool program. So that has been a concern that I've seen that people are worried about having their records go to the school district, um, but they are under their you know, confidentiality rules and they can't just share your child's records with anybody. They they become you know they they start a file, um, but but that is something just important to realize that when you do share, do sign that, then you can. That means that the preschool program, um, the IU typically, and the um, school district can then discuss and share records um, with each other. So, um, so that is the um, intent to register form. And that again, happens at the meeting. Um, and the meetings are typically, um, if, if anyone else has been through it, if you wanna type in and share your experiences, but the meetings are very fast. They're not like IEP meetings and they aren't IEP meetings. They're about, they usually hold them every 15 minutes. Um, and they, like I said, they happen in February. And you know, when I um, used to represent um, school districts, I would hear them talk about, you know, how quick these meetings were. And it always kind of took me by surprise because these are like, this really starts the process for the school districts. And they're kind of like banging parents out, you know, really super fast. So um, it, it's important to know um, that, you know, they're not IEP meetings, but they're, but it is extremely important. Um, so Katie, we have a couple um, comments in the chat and then we got one that came in the Q&A. Okay. Uh, so I'll go ahead and read the Q&A because um, it's on the transition meetings and then we'll get to the comments in the chat. Are there any key points to look for during the transition meeting? We have already had ours. I signed the intent and registered for kindergarten, but wanted to make sure there was nothing else I should have done prior to the school evaluation. So no, because um, like I said, the transition meeting is really the very beginning of the process for the school district. You know, I, there's supposed to be, like I have up here on this next slide, there's supposed to be a discussion of the next form, which is the notice of options for your child's transition. But that is another form that you're supposed to be given at the meeting. I've seen it where um, parents have received them after the fact. Um, and it's because, you know, really they have like all of these meetings, you know, the, the, you know, they'll have a school district, you know, scheduled for, um, let's say February 8th, and they'll have like 20 kids that they're running through. And oftentimes the school district representative who's there is seeing, and really it should be legally, that they're seeing your child's information for the very first time, because, you know, there hasn't been any paperwork signed you haven't agreed that you could share records yet. So it really is the first time, but there is supposed to be a discussion from the preschool program with you, the parent and the school district representative talking about you know, your child's programming, your child's needs, you know, what their disability is um, and determining 
you know, is there, should there be, um, you know, an evaluation? Are we just going to adopt the early intervention IEP, which they can, um, but do we need an evaluation? All of that is supposed to be discussed at the transition meeting. Like I said, because of how fast they are and because of how many um, families they have scheduled in one day is often super fast. And there's a follow-up meeting um, of some sort. And I've seen them as IEP meetings, which I don't know if they should be called IEP meetings legally because you know they haven't evaluated yet. Um, but sometimes I have seen them be held as IEP meetings if this notice of options for your child's transition form hasn't been reviewed with you. Um, so, so as I have here, the options are um, that they can adopt the early intervention IEP, they can adopt the early intervention IEP with revisions um, and determining whether reevaluation is necessary. You as the parent, just as in early intervention, same thing with school age, you're an important voice in the decision. This is not a unilateral decision by the school district. Um, and I'm going to get to um, a little bit on which option they choose and what they should be doing. Um, but um, that is what they're, what they're deciding, essentially. Are they adopting the IEP that's currently being implemented? Are they going to change it and are they going to reevaluate? So we bring any documentation to the transition um, meeting, any diagnosis paperwork. It's definitely helpful because um, depending on your intermediate unit and your preschool program, um, you know, and how well their documentation is, and you know, some are better than others. Um, it's very important because your school district doesn't know your child, it's important to give them all the information. So they can appropriately program and come up with a really good plan coming into kindergarten. So yes, I would bring um, anything that could help in, especially the decision of whether they need to do a reevaluation. I would say that you know presenting diagnosis paperwork is a good indicator that they're probably going to ne be needing to do a reevaluation, and you want to make sure that they have enough time to do that. Because after that reevaluation, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit, after the reevaluation, there's going to be an IEP meeting. So you want all of that to be um, in time. Um, why wouldn't we want, oh, um, why wouldn't we want the district to do the evaluation and just roll over the EI eval IEP? Um, so, I mean, that is typically the process that you want a school district to do their own evaluation. I'm going to talk about why in a second. Um, and just rolling over the EI um, eval I, and IEP is tricky because it's, as we're going to talk about in a little bit, it's very different. The, the early intervention IEPs are very different than school age IEPs. So, um, so it, it, everything depends on your situation, but I always err on that side of the school district's gonna have to evaluate eventually, and you wanna make sure that they have a good sense of who your child is and will be in the school setting um, and makes, um, you know, is making recommendations based on data and their own assessments. If the family brings an attorney, will the district do so as well? Yes. Um, the, if a family brings an attorney, um, the, the school districts and the intermediate units are all represented by counsel. So if you're bringing a, an attorney to a transition meeting, then the, the um, everyone needs to be put on notice because then all of the attorneys need to be there. So you can't just bring an attorney. Um, so it sounds like these meetings are required. Should we have had one? Yes, you should have had one. Yes, um, they are required. They're legally required. Um, there is one question. Sorry, I just cut you off. I guess we we're doing the same thing. Um, in the Q&A, there's a question. Notice of options for your child transition. Do you have an example of this form that you could possibly either show on the screen or maybe email to me that I can maybe forward to everyone? It typically, I, I think that there is a state, um, I think that there is a state form, but 
it's not required. The school districts sometimes come up with their own, but there's kind of kind of boxes and check boxes. Um, so the next question then, when you're trying to decide what is going to happen, should the school district reevaluate? Um, and so legally, they're not required to evaluate. They don't have to evaluate prior to the start of kindergarten. Um, and the reason for that is because your child, by being identified um, in early intervention in, in three to five, they're already eligible in Pennsylvania and they're already eligible in the IDEA. They're eligible in a different section of the law, but they are eligible for special education. So that means that um, if the school district doesn't evaluate, they continue on into kindergarten as a special education student. Um, and they, tr they do initial evaluations. It is not an initial evaluation. Um, it is a reevaluation. So, and the reason why that's important, and I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit too, is that um, if, if they're, your child, like say you don't get the process done and kindergarten comes, your child is starting day one as a special education student and with all of the rights that attach to that. So that's just important to know that, again, your child was found eligible um, and they're doing a reevaluation and not an initial uh, evaluation. A lot of school districts, um, especially if there is an autism diagnosis from early intervention or a speech and language um, disability category, sometimes they will just accept without doing a reevaluation, they will accept the diagnosis because that is a school age disability category that qualifies them in school age. Um, and so sometimes they will just accept it and not do the reevaluation and just hold an IEP meeting. I've seen this happen and, and, and this is legally okay. I've seen this happen, especially if the preschool program has um, already done an evaluation and has current data. Um, and then, you know, and, and your child has been found to have autism. I've seen the school districts pretty much, they don't adopt it, but they use it then in, in and then the current um, early intervention IEP to develop their IEP. That is okay to do. Um, I'm gonna talk about, the problem is, is when I've seen, when they start reducing services. Um, so I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit, but just to kind of give you a, a background that it is okay if you, have certain disability categories if your child has already been found to have one that's the same as school age. The big one that is not the same that I have here is, is a developmental, um, I put developmental disability, but it's a develop, developmental delay disability. The DD as, as they call it for short, that is not a school age disability category. So if your child has a developmental delay um, through early intervention, there will need to be a reevaluation by the school district by December 1st. So sometimes if they don't get to it and they say, you know what, based off of this IEP, we can implement this at least starting in September. And then once we get to September, October, we can do the reevaluation. Um, but there will, must, will, and must be a reevaluation if your child has a developmental delay again, because of the different sections of the IDEA, developmental delay is not a school age disability category. Um, so just to kind of let you guys know. Um, so will an intellectual disability um, diagnosis be accepted if it's medically diagnosed? Um, not necessarily. So if you provide outside um, medical diagnoses, they um, have to be considered by the school district. It certainly puts the school district um, on notice that there's a suspected area of disability. And what it does is it, it requires then the school district to do an assessment to evaluate for intellectual disability. But if you, and this is not just for ID, but also for ADHD, um, dyslexia, um, by giving the school district diagnoses, it, the school district doesn't have to accept them, but it does put them on notice that there is a disability and they need to assess and evaluate further. I hope, I hope that makes sense. 
Okay, so if the school district decides to evaluate, like I like I said, it is a reevaluation. It is not an, an initial evaluation, um, and that you as the parent need to be included in the decision regarding a reevaluation. And so it's not even just um, should the school district do a, a reevaluation, but what should they do as part of that evaluation? So um, oftentimes, and I have on here about a, a records review reevaluation. Um, sometimes, and especially if the um, early intervention um, just did an evaluation, sometimes what the districts will do, and this is also, say there was a, um, a developmental delay, a developmental delay as the disability category, and, this, and the um, preschool program just did an evaluation. Depending on the situation, there might be enough for them to them the school district to just review the records and decide um, what goes into their evaluation or what or if they have enough just by going through all of the records and sometimes they'll do an observation by coming to and figuring out what the disability will be for school age. Um, again, you as the parent have a say in that, and you as the parent can ask for assessments. So if you think that more is going on, um, you know, say, for instance, your child has a speech and language um, impairment and just has a, a IEP for articulation through early intervention, but you think that there's something more going on, you know, emotionally, um, something more going on, you know, with academics and learning. Um, and you know you're at this you're at the meeting and the school district's like oh it's just articulation speech that's okay you know you can say hold on you know I think something else is going on and put them right on notice that you know you're asking for them to assess in, in certain areas so even if your child doesn't currently qualify for um, let's say you know emotional and behavioral services you can if there are issues going on and the school sees issues too, you have a say in what that evaluation is gonna consist of. So I, I tell everyone to be, you know, it, it is so important as a parent to be active member of the team and to speak up and to advocate for your child um, and to be the squeaky wheel. Everyone gets nervous and, you know, and there's a way to do that without being, you know, confrontational, you know, and, and just advocating for your child. And people get nervous, especially in, in the very beginning, um, to be that way. But you really have to be, because like I said, they're already going through so many children and so many families that you want to give them as much information as possible. And you want to speak up, especially if you don't agree with something or you have any questions at all. It's very easy for people who are in this world to speak with acronyms, it's very easy for people in this world to just assume that everybody knows what we're talking about. And this is like I started off saying, this is extremely complicated. Um, and it's, a, it's, you know, I mean, there's a lot of litigation and due process. So, you know, meaning that there's a lot of times that schools and I use get things wrong. Um, and so it, it's okay to ask questions and it's okay to understand and you know, really want things explained to. So I, I, I put that out for everybody to really advocate for your child, to speak up um, and to ask questions and don't let them just, you know, assume that you know. If you don't know, it's totally fine to ask. Um, and so when there is um, a review of records reevaluation, so sometimes it totally depends on the school district. Some of them have a process where they will always do a records review and determine whether additional data is needed. So that is part of a reevaluation process. And as you go through, you know, in school age, you know, in elementary and middle, it's the same kind of thing. There's always a determination by looking at records, whether there needs to be additional data. And if there is additional data needed, they will issue a permission to reevaluate. So that's the form that um, is your prior written notice where you, um, where the school district says, this is what we wanna assess your child for. Um, and they have on, it's usually on the second page of that, all the different assessments that they wanna do. Um, this is my like huge tip when it comes to reevaluations. 
Um, and I and I always said it to the school districts too, and I'm saying it to parents, never, ever, 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 ever waive an evaluation. Um, and you know, for parents, it's important not to waive because your child changes. I mean, we all know as parents, right? Like from even just from three to four years old, how much they change in one year. So, you know, just because um, data said one thing um, on one year doesn't mean that your child hasn't grown, you know, and this is not just for this period of time from, you know, age five to six, but even when, when you get into services with the school district, you really you don't want to waive a reevaluation. Um, so I have a speech only kid. Can I ask the district for a full eval? Yes, you can ask for, if you have a speech only kid, you can ask the district for a full eval. Um, if you can ask no matter what, but if you have specific reasons for why you're asking, you want to put that right out in your request. You want to say, you know, my child is having, you know, behavioral problems, or I'm noticing that my child's not picking up his or her letters as quickly as some peers. Um, so because they can say no to you. So just because you ask for a full eval doesn't mean that they have to do it. It's certainly, if they say no, I think that puts them at a risk of huge liability if it does turn out that your child has other disabilities. But if you want a full eval and you can point to reasons for that, I would put that, I would say that right at the transition meeting. I would put it in writing and ask for it. You wanna make a record um, and, and of all of your requests. Okay, so timelines for the reevaluation. The, once you get the permission to reevaluate um, and you agree with it and you sign it and you give it back to the school district, the date that they receive it back, so it's not the date you sign it, it's the date that the school district actually receives it, that's when their 60 days start. So this, they have 60 days. This is, I mean, this is in the IDEA, it's 60 days. In Pennsylvania, it's 60 days, except for summer days. So, you know, when we're talking about transition and summer, this becomes, this is why the February dates are so important because of everything that needs to get done to have a good IEP and program and placement on the table by the first day of school. So um, if the school district delays this, that's definitely um, a, a problem for them um, with having a really good, um, you know, IEP on the table for your child, but that's just important for you guys to realize that they do get two months essentially to do it and the summers don't count. Um, and especially with how short staffed everybody is right now because of COVID and just everything that's happened over the last two years. Um, if they're doing anything over the summer, typically they're doing things that are late um, from uh, from the from the school year, um, or they don't even they're not even giving school psychologists summer hours um, to to do the evaluation. So it's really important um, when you get the permission to reevaluate to sign it right away and get it back to them so their timeline starts. Um, and you don't want to sit on it unless you have questions and you absolutely have a right to ask for a meeting once you get it to really understand it better of what they're asking for. But because of the timelines and because the summer doesn't count, you really don't want to delay in getting that permission to reevaluate back to them. Um, and I have here, as per Pennsylvania Department of Education guidance, an IEP meeting must be held within 30 days of the parent's receipt of the reevaluation report. And why I say per Pennsylvania Department of Education guidance is that technically and legally in the IDEA and in Chapter 14, which is Pennsylvania uh, regulations, the, the 30 days following a, um, between a, 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 um, an evaluation and an IEP meeting is only for an initial evaluation. There's actually no um, law that requires the 30 days for a reevaluation, but the um, Pennsylvania Department of Education has been, um, they basically have guidance to the school districts and they, they will actually cite them when they do their compliance monitoring if they don't follow this rule. But I always just tell people that it's, it's really a, a function in Pennsylvania. It's not a 
federal law, it of Pennsylvania law, about the 30 days between a reevaluation report and an IEP meeting. Um, the other um, thing that you should be aware of is that you legally have 10 days to review the reevaluation report prior to an IEP meeting being scheduled. Um, this timeline, I've seen it waived all the time because people, you know, want to have their meetings. But just so you know, in the back of your mind, if you did want more time to really understand the reevaluation report, sometimes people take the reevaluation report to, you know, sometimes people have family members who are teachers or you're just trying to understand more before you actually sit down at that meeting. You do have that time under the law um, that you do have um, 10 days to review before the meeting. So what happens, like I said, you know, summers don't count. So what happens if the RR is not completed prior to the start of the school year? So if um, they haven't finished it and they haven't had the IEP meeting, then they must implement the early intervention IEP on the very first day of school as closely as they can. Because sometimes the way that things are written, you know, they're written for preschool or they're written for the preschool programs. Um, and so, they have to implement as closely as they can that early intervention IEP um, on the first day of school if their RR isn't done and they haven't had an IEP meeting. Um, this is very important. If they try to change or reduce services, there must before that RR is done. So say, you know, the RR didn't get done by June 30th and they are like, crap, you know, this is still pending, but we still have all these assessments that we need to do. But, we, but they're thinking, they're not telling you this, but they're thinking there's no way that we can implement this IEP. Um, be careful if they wanna have an IEP meeting with you prior to the RR being done. Because what I have seen repeatedly, and this is not just in one area in Pennsylvania, this is multiple different IUs, multiple different school districts, is that they're bringing you in for an IEP meeting and you know you fought so hard to get you know, speech three times a week um, or um, whatever else is in that IEP and early intervention that has been working so well for your child that, you know, you were working as a team with that early intervention team. Be careful because the school district will try to take your speech that's three times a week and go down to one or two times a week without any data or justification at all. So I put that out there and that's not just, you know, being like hateful, you know, it's what I've seen repeatedly when I look at IEPs um, coming, you know, coming into kindergarten um, and I compare them to the EI IEP and I'm like, why is there less services in here? Um, and so just be, just be wary of that. Um, you know, put that, you know, if you are taking notes, just write that down that if you're being, if the RR isn't done and you're being asked to come in for an IEP meeting, which you should absolutely go to, you should not, you know, ever say no to an IEP meeting if they want to have a meeting with you, but just be careful of what they're actually offering you and make sure you're comparing it to what is in the early intervention IEP. I've seen it happen way too many times to people. Katie, there's a question in the Q&A. Can you clarify the days? For example, are you talking calendar days or business days, days of the week? Yes, so the 60 days and the 10 days are calendar days. Um, they are not school days, they are not business days, they are calendar days. Um, so the, um, that's it. and again, the summers don't count um, for the school, and that's the school district summer. So from the last day of the day after the last day of school until the first day of school, those days, and this is forever. This isn't just for this process. This is like when your child, you know, is in like high school um, and you're getting a reevaluation done. It's still the summers don't count and they don't have to. There's nothing to force them to evaluate over the summer. Um, is RR records reviews. Oh, an RR is a reevaluation report. I'm sorry if I used um, an acronym. Um, if the evaluation is not done and they implement the preschool IEP for the first day, how long does the district have from that date to complete the RR? So they would have, they would have to complete the RR by the 60th day. So say they issue you um, the permission to reevaluate in April and you sign it um, and say they get it back April 30th. 
um, depending on their school year, the RR would probably be due early September, um, mid mid September. So they would have to get that RR done in their 60 day timeline, excluding the summer. Um, does it often get overlooked and floated without a new evaluation and IEP? Um, do you mean the R the RR? Um, so it depends on where you're at, honestly. It depends on your school district. It depends, it really depends on where you are. I can say, you know, in in a lot of school districts, they if they are doing an RR, there's typically, again, depending where you are, there's typically a school psychologists that are specifically assigned for early intervention transitions. Um, and so some school districts do it much better than other school districts. Um, okay, so what happens if you don't agree with the school district's offered IEP? Um, the number one thing, if you can take anything away from this, is that stay put and pendency applies. What does that mean? So what that means is that if you are happy with what your child is getting in early intervention and you're happy with that IEP, so the example that I was just talking about where um, they try to reduce services and they try to, you know, go from, you know, where your child ha was having um, co-treatment sometimes, like where speech and OT will co-treat together. Um, and they want to take that out because they don't really do that. That's not what we do here. Um, you can fight them and it doesn't necessarily mean you file due process. You can file mediation and that stops it too. The big thing is that it, in Pennsylvania, the parent must file. Um, and I have the website right here. It's, it's very parent friendly on this website, the ODR, the Office of Dispute Resolution, um, where you can click for both due process and mediation. You can complete it right on their website. And as long as you complete that within 10 days of getting the NORAP, and the NORAP is, and you've, you've gotten similar um, prior written notices in early intervention. Um, but the NORAP acts as the trigger that changes the placement. So if you disagree at all with what the school district is doing, and you want to keep the early intervention IEP in place uh, while you're disputing the school district's IEP, you must go on this website, you must complete the mediation or due process request, within 10 days of getting that NORAP. That is so important because there are cases in Pennsylvania where parents did this after the 10th day and they lost their pendency. So um, again, pendency applies. Your child is in special education. Um, and if you disagree at all with what they're doing, um, you can stop it. But it, it's, again, like there is a mechanism in place that if you are not happy and you don't agree with what the school district is doing, you can stop them um, and call the ARC um, to help you out and, you know, to figure out next steps um, with what to do. But that is like the biggest thing I want you to understand is that you do have power and you do have rights and the school district cannot just act unilaterally. unilaterally. Um, okay. And so this is the other big one. You know, we talk about changing the IEP, but what happens if they find your child does not qualify for special education in the school? So this does happen a lot. Um, and that, again, they must, just like when they were the situation where they were changing an IEP, if they're saying that your child does not qualify for special education in the school district, they must issue you that NORAP, the Notice of Recommended Educational Placement that says your child doesn't qualify. And you have that 10 days as well to dispute that, that you can file um, and dispute it. And your child would start on the first day of kindergarten it, while you're in the dispute. Your child would start with the IEP um, from early intervention in place as a special education student. You also have, and, and this applies to, you know, all, all evaluations, but especially in this situation where they're saying that your child is no longer eligible and you believe, and, you know, they've just had an evaluation, say, through early intervention, that your child's still qualified. Um, you do have the right to ask for an independent educational evaluation. So, and this, again, is for any time 
moving forward that you disagree with what the school district is proposing in their reevaluation report. Um, if you disagree with it and the reevaluation is not appropriate. And again, like that's not something that you might know as a parent. And so we always encourage people, again, reach back out to the ARC and they can help you kind of talk about, you know, whether the reevaluation is not appropriate. Um, but if you disagree and the reevaluation is not appropriate, then you do have a right to a publicly funded independent educational evaluation. Um, and that is the acronym for that is an IEE. Um, and in the law, there's only two things that the school district can do. They can either say yes, or they can either say no and file a due process complaint. So there's no kind of in between. There's no, oh, well, let us redo it. And here's a new permission to reevaluate, which some districts love to try to pull. Um, no, if you're asking for an independent evaluation, they either have to give it to you or they have to file a due process complaint to defend their report to say no to you. So it's it the filing of the due process complaint does happen. Um, I wouldn't say that it's very often, um, but that it does happen. Um, but but um, that is that is essentially um, you know your right to an IEE throughout the entire process of you know again not just the transition into kindergarten, but also you know if you disagree, like say five years from now you're trying to exit your child or you're having a disagreement of what the disability is. Um, you always have the, the possible right. And I say possible because it's not just disagreeing, but also if the school district's reevaluation is not appropriate. Um, so what would an independent evaluation be? Someone other than the district? Yes. Um, so it is someone other than the school district. There are tons of evaluators out there in all of the areas. So not just the school psychologists, but also speech evaluators, occupational therapist evaluators. If there's behavior issues, um, you know, BCBAs, uh, a board certified behavior analysts who do functional behavior assessments to figure out what's going on with your child's behaviors. So yes, it's somebody other than um, the district, it's somebody who's taking a totally independent view of what's going on with your child and really giving um, an independent voice to what your child's needs are. Um, that would be the responsibility of the district at that point, or would you suggest getting one on our own and bringing it to the district? So um, if you can afford it, um, so if you can afford it, um, depending on your situation, um, it's quicker to get one on your own um, because you don't have to go through the request, the rigmarole um, with, you know, sometimes they, they will take 10 days to get back to you um, and then you're trying to find somebody. So you can get it on your own and then, and then ask the district to reimburse you. Um, who pays for the independent evaluation? So it's, it would be the school district that pays for the independent evaluation if you have a right to it. So again, it's showing them that their reevaluation is not appropriate. The best way, um, the best example I would say um, is, um, so going back to the speech, the, the person who has the speech only child, if there are issues going on with your child and you tell them, you know, like, yes, I know that my child only has speech issue, but there's all these academic issues going on. You know, my child has, has trouble sitting, focus, attention. Those are called executive functioning issues. So, you know, possible ADHD. Um, so if you're sitting there telling the school district that there's all these things, and then they only do, say they only do an IQ and academic achievement, but they don't look into any of these other issues of, you know, the attention deficits, or, you know, maybe there's, you know, some social skills issues going on, you know, with your child making friends, um, and you tell them this, and they don't evaluate for that. That is a good example of how their evaluation is not appropriate um, by, um, you know, showing that they, that they knew things, they had areas of suspected disability. That's what the standard is in the law, is that if there's, um, areas of suspected disability that they are required to evaluate those areas of suspected disability. Okay. 
so this is a lot of different um, terminology um, that I just, you know, wanted to kind of throw at you guys because this is not something that you typically see in early intervention um, as far as just the language of, you know, what the different placements would be. Um, sure. Um, okay, so supplementary aids and services. So this is when you're going through the IEP. Um, in the law, there is a um, directive to it, not just in the statute, but all of the case law from, from judges and court cases, that there is a mandate, especially here in Pennsylvania, there was actually a huge class action lawsuit like 20, 25 years ago about inclusion. Um, and, you know, the, de the default is that your child is in the general education classroom for as much as possible. And so the way that the Pennsylvania um, state IEP forms have been revised since that class action lawsuit, um, there's a section at the end after you go through all of the programming. So same kind of thing with EI, where you're looking at um, annual goals and what you want you know, your child to accomplish over the next IEP year. Um, when you get near the end of the IEP, there's placement sections and there's questions for the IEP team. And all of those questions are targeted at what has the team talked about as far as supplementary aids and services for your child to be included as much as possible. So, you know, many parents have many different views on, you know, inclusion and how much their child should be in the regular education classroom. There's all different kinds of reasons for why people believe that. Um, you know, I've seen people want their child, no matter what, to be in the regular education classroom. I've seen parents want their child, no matter what, to be in special education classroom. I'm just giving you what the law is. And the law is that they have to try as much as possible to have your child in the regular education classroom. So in a typical kindergarten classroom. Um, so the questions that the team is going to ask at the IEP meeting and at your initial IEP meeting um, are, you know, after you've gone through the IEP. So you've gone through the goals, you've gone through specially designed instruction. You know, what is specially designed instruction? That's different things that they need to do to either teach your child or, or provide accommodations to your child or modifications to the curriculum. Um, and so supplementary aids and services are really looking at, you know, if your child is, is in the typical classroom for reading, um, what, what does your child possibly need? Do they need small group instruction? Do they need to be read to? Do they need um, sometimes technology um, to help them? So different um, things, and, and you have already have gone through this in the IEP. These questions are at the end when you're talking about placement um, of, you know, how much is your child going to be in the regular education classroom versus the special education classroom? So there's different types of special education support, and I've listed them all here. Um, you know, learning support, life skills, emotional support. These are definitely, you know, terminologies like you, you know, typically, you know, you have the, um, you know, special specialized instruction um, and um, different, there's, it's just the different terminologies, but this is in the law and in Pennsylvania, what the different types of support and really placements are. So I have here the amount of special ed placement. And so you, you will eventually understand these terms as you start really going through every year. Um, but full-time you know, does not necessarily mean 100%. It means more than 80% or more of your child's day is in a special education classroom. So it's not um, that your child is getting special education supports because of course the IEP is, you know, with your child throughout their entire day. Um, and the IEP, you know, every teacher who's teaching your child should have a copy of the IEP, you should know exactly what your child needs in their class. So, you know, if your child goes to music class, that music teacher should know what the, he or she needs to do for your child as far as, you know, different modifications or accommodations to be made in the class for your child. Um, Sometimes there will be um, a co-teaching situation in a regular education classroom. So say that there's like a math class 
that's a regular education math class with a regular education teacher, but they have something called a co-teacher and that's a special education teacher also teaches in there. But there's kids who don't have IEPs, there's kids who have IEPs, um, that would be considered a regular education classroom. Um, so a, this, when you're looking at full-time supplemental and itinerant, it is actual pull out of regular education and in special education. So just so you know, if it, so if they're offering you itinerant to start, that means that your child is probably only having like one period of the day, um, possibly two periods, although that's probably getting close to supplemental, but that's the least amount of actual special education in a special education class that a child can have. So again, these are different, you know, terms and terminologies um, that you don't see, um, but, but, you know, gets used. And, and so what's going to happen is that you're going to have the IEP meeting. Um, and at the IEP meeting, there, when you do eventually have that IEP meeting, there should be a, the special education teacher who's going to act as your case manager. That shouldn't be anything new, but there should also be um, and it is required that the regular education teacher be present as well. Um, and this is at every single IEP meeting, unless you waive the regular education teacher's presence, the regular education teacher must be there. Um, and then there must be something called an LEA. Um, and so it's typically either the principal, um, sometimes it's um, a special education administrator. Sometimes I've seen them be guidance counselors, which they really shouldn't be because the LEA, the local education agency, is the one who is supposed to have decision-making. And in that decision-making is, is the ability to spend money. Um, and so, you know, say the team is talking and, and um, everyone's like, oh, wow, I, I think that your child could really use, you know, assistive technology device, you know, should really start learning on something like that. Um, then there should be the ability right then and there for the person, the LEA, to make that decision and be, yes, that's what we're doing. Um, or you're having a discussion about summer programming and whether your child qualifies for um, what they call extended school year um, for school age services. Um, will, you know, will, um, they should have the ability right then and there to say, yes, your child does qualify um, for extended school year services. So um, just to keep that, that's, those are gonna be the players at your meeting. Um, it's gonna be someone called, like I said, an LEA, the special education teacher who likely drafted the IEP um, the, and a regular education teacher. If your child qualifies for related services like speech or OT or uh, physical therapy, those therapists should be there as well. Um, and so all of those people are there and then they're talking to you about, you know, of course, you know, what the evaluation says. So there's gonna be the section also similar to early intervention um, where they talk about present levels and it'll be, it'll be broken down into present levels of academic achievement. So, you know, if they've, they've done testing on, you know, letters and numbers um, and things like that, then there's gonna be a, a, a section of, um, functional um, performance. So um, that's where your speech and your OT and behaviors get put into there. There's a section for parent concerns, specifically on every single IEP, parent concerns. And you should definitely be very vocal about what your concerns are. Um, I mean, even if you think it's the littlest thing, just being very vocal about, you know, even if it's just your child's transition into kindergarten. Um, you know, you should definitely be vocal about that. There's an, there is then the annual goal section um, after those kind of initial, you know, you should be able, you should get your child's IEP and be able to read the beginning where they have all of the present levels and be like, that's my child. You know, it should have all of that information in there so that anybody, any teacher who picks up your child's IEP in kindergarten or you know, whatever, whenever, I mean, this applies to everything. I mean, this applies in EI as well, that they should be able to pick up the IEP and know exactly who your child is, know exactly what goals he or she's working on, know exactly what kind of accommodations your child's getting in the classroom. 
Um, and, and, you know, it doesn't need to be so like sometimes, you know, and this, again, this is also for EI, but sometimes the way the IEPs are written, it's like so far over um, people's heads um, and it's just like, you should be, it just should be, you know, a story of like, this is who your child is right now. Um, so there's a question, is it a good idea to put parent concerns in writing? Um, in your example of the RR where the child just receives speech and the parent has additional concerns. Yeah. Um, so part of the reevaluation, you should get a parent input form, um, and you should absolutely put all of you know, all of your information, you know, and your concerns in writing, definitely. Um, if you don't get a parent input form, um, you should still put everything in writing. So same thing for the IEP as well. Um, you should, because there is that section for parent concerns that, you know, to put everything down in writing. So sometimes people just send the special education teacher an email, like, you know, here's my concerns, and they attach it into the IEP. Um, and so that is a lot of information that I just gave to you guys. Um, is it allowed to have their ABA director who has known them since age two attend the IEP meeting? Can we bring anyone we want? Yes, that is extremely um, important. And I'm sorry that I didn't say that before, um, but you can bring anyone you want to the IEP meeting, absolutely. Um, and that's the same thing in early intervention as well. Um, but yes, you as the parent can bring anyone there to speak about who your child is um, and, and even just to help you. Um, because, you know, what I've seen before with, with some parents have done is they'll bring someone just to be a note taker, um, which I think is such a good idea. Um, it's like a friend um, or someone else that's literally just there taking notes because when you're in those meetings, I mean, and you guys know, like, especially going through inter early intervention, you just like, it's just like information overload, you know, and it's about your child and it's so emotional. Um, and so I thought, I just think that that's brilliant, you know, to bring somebody that you trust that, you know, you, there's a lot of sensitive information about your child. Um, but just bringing someone or like if, if you have, you know, like your spouse or your, your child's um, parent, you know, if you both go and one of you, you know, assign each other, like, okay, one, one of you is going to be taking notes and the other one's going to be like an active participant. But I just think that that's a great idea because there's so many times that you forget about um, what is said again. Because um, but one that was specific to one of your slides, do we need to specifically request those people to attend? Just to be clear, in kindergarten, the people who should be present are their regular education kindergarten teacher, their special education teacher, a representative from the school principal, and a representative from the district, as well as any therapist, and of course the parent. Is that correct? Yes. So it doesn't have to be a representative from the district and the principal. The principal can act as that LEA, like I was saying, that that's the person who is the decision maker. But legally, um, in the IDA, the special education teacher, regular education teacher, the therapist, they're, they're all required to attend. So ahead of the meeting, you will get or you should get um, an invitation that lists out all of the people who've been invited to the meeting. If there's somebody on there that um, you think should be there that isn't, I would absolutely shoot an email over and say, hey, you know, so-and-so is a speech therapist. Why isn't that person on here? Um, or even like, if you don't see a regular education teacher, by law, there is supposed to be a regular education teacher there. Um, unless you waive their presence. So that happens sometimes that you feel, I've seen parents feel pressured into waiving, um, you know, people's presence, but you shouldn't, especially in the beginning, like you, that you've never been in the school before um, or your child. I mean, even if you've had other children, you know, older children go through, but you've never been through special education in the school before. I wouldn't waive anyone's presence, at least in the beginning, until you really have a handle on know what your child's program is going to be. Um, I know for our district, they sometimes do not have a class list until the first day of school. Can I request specific teachers or therapists prior to the meeting? Um, 
So that is true, especially with scheduling um, and enrollment, because sometimes registrations happen over the summer um, that they might not be able to say, like, this is who your child is definitely assigned to. They typically know the special education teacher, though. Um, you can request specific teachers, although, you know, depending on scheduling, and especially if your child's not you know, if they don't have any, everybody assigned yet, they might not be able to accommodate that. Um, so that, that is a good point about, you know, enrollment and registration happening over the summer. And, and it is um, accurate that, you know, sometimes in August is when everything gets, gets sorted out. Um, so you can certainly ask, they don't have to agree to that, but they have to have somebody that's a regular education teacher that can speak to what is going to happen in the kindergarten classroom. They have to have a special education teacher who is going to speak to um, the special education piece. And then of course the therapist, if your child qualifies. Great. We just got one more on this topic. If the reevaluation report is being covered, the evaluator has to be there too, right? Typically this is a school psychologist. So there's actually nothing that requires the school psychologist to be there. Um, nothing in the law. Um, so if, if you get that invitation and the school psychologist is not on there, um, so, so typically what people refer to this, and there are some districts who just have policies and procedures that where there is a reevaluation meeting um, or you know, that the school psychologist, or sometimes they combine the reevaluation and an IEP meeting, but there's actually nothing legally requiring them to have what some call a reevaluation meeting. So sometimes districts will have the school psychologist will contact you and go over the results or the therapist, you know, speech therapist will contact you and go over the results, but there's nothing that requires them to be there. But again, you can ask for them to be there, especially, you know, if there are recommendations that were made or you have questions that you can always ask for them to be there. 